Greetings and welcome to Train Signal. You're watching Microsoft Exchange Unified Messaging Integration. In this video, we're going to see the features of Unified Messaging Integration. We're also going to look at the prerequisites required to set it up. And then we'll look at an overview of what the install process is like. And then of course we'll wrap it up with a demonstration where you get to see how to set up the integration. Microsoft Link Server 2013 supports integration with Microsoft Exchange Unified Messaging. We can integrate Link with Exchange going all the way back to Exchange Server 2007 SP1. This allows us to combine our voice messaging and our email messaging into a single messaging infrastructure. Your voicemails get stored on your Microsoft Exchange databases. With Microsoft Exchange Server 2007 and 2010, the unified messaging role is deployed as part of the installation process. And in a lot of cases, it may be set up on a dedicated unified messaging server as a standalone role. In Microsoft Exchange Server 2013, the unified messaging runs as a service on your mailbox server. As we deploy Enterprise Voice at Covrock Fitness, if a call goes unanswered, we want to make sure that we're able to retrieve a voicemail. Well, that's what the integration of Exchange and Unified Messaging with Link is going to provide for us. Once we have integrated Microsoft Exchange with Link Server, when a call comes into the organization for an enterprise voice-enabled user, if the user is unable to answer the call, the call can get serviced by the Unified Messaging Server. The Unified Messaging Server can play a personal greeting, record a message, and submit the message to be queued for delivery to the user's mailbox, which is stored over on your Microsoft Exchange server your mailbox server. So if a user does leave a voicemail, the voicemail gets routed over to our mailbox. If the caller doesn't leave a voicemail, we get a missed call notification stored inside of our mailbox. So in either case, we know that we have a new voicemail or we have a missed call. As an end user, we have the ability to gain access to our voicemail coming in through your mail clients like Outlook, Outlook Web Access, or even ActiveSync. We can even use the feature called Outlook Voice Access where we can dial into a number and gain access to the Microsoft Exchange server as well as our voicemail. Let's take a closer look at Outlook Voice Access. Outlook Voice Access used to be called Subscriber Access. In order to use this feature, the Microsoft Exchange Administrator, the UM Administrator, would go in and they would assign telephone numbers for dialing into the Unified Messaging Server. If a user dials in using Outlook Voice Access, when they dial into the subscriber access line, it allows them to gain access to their inbox, to their email, their calendar, also their contact information and the global address list. It allows a user coming in through the phone system to be able to use a lot of the features of Microsoft Exchange. When you set up the Exchange Unified Messaging Server, the UM server can integrate with an IP-based PBX directly. It can also integrate with legacy PBXs going through an IP-based gateway. Your Microsoft Exchange server is going to treat your link server like an IP-based PBX. It will communicate over with your front-end servers directly. When you're setting up the unified messaging server, you're going to have to define or set up your auto attendance. When you define an auto attendant, you define a telephone number that a user can dial from outside of the organization to reach a company representative coming in through a menu system. So it's a menu-driven or automated system that allows users to navigate throughout the environment. The Microsoft Exchange Unified Messaging Administrator can customize the auto attendance as required. Another feature provided by the Unified Messaging Server is fax services capabilities. When Microsoft first introduced the Unified Messaging Server back with Exchange Server 2007, the 2007 version of the product had built-in support for incoming fax, and if you wanted to provide outgoing fax capabilities, it required a third-party software. Well, when Microsoft released Exchange Server 2010, in order to support both incoming and outgoing fax, in both cases it requires third-party software. As a Microsoft Exchange client, you can open up your mailbox and see your fax. Another user-friendly feature that we have with Microsoft Link 2013 is called the Unified Contact Store. The Unified Contact Store allows us to unify contacts across Microsoft Exchange and Microsoft Link. So instead of your Link and your Outlook clients having different contacts or separate contact lists, it unifies them over on the Microsoft Exchange server side. So if you create a contact inside of Link, it's going to show up as a personal contact over on Outlook. So whether you're connecting in with the Link 2013 client, Outlook 2013, or possibly Outlook Web Access, you should expect to see similar results as you're connecting in with your various clients. 
When you deploy Microsoft Link on-premise inside of your organization, you have the ability to integrate Microsoft Link with Microsoft Exchange Outlook Web Application, OWA. If you integrate Microsoft Link with OWA, it allows your Outlook Web Access-based clients the ability to use instant messaging and presence from within inside of the web-based interface. At Carfrock Fitness, we have an internal Microsoft Exchange environment. But if your environment was being hosted externally off-premise, you would have to define a shared SIP address inside of Microsoft Link. You would also have to configure your hosting provider, and this information would have to replicate to CMS out onto the edge. When you integrate Microsoft Exchange and Microsoft Link, we have the ability to enable archiving, and we can archive our instant messaging content and conferencing content over to the Microsoft Exchange server. With Microsoft Link 2010, we had the ability to enable archiving, but we had to archive over to a SQL Server database store. Well, Microsoft Link supports archiving to a database on SQL still, but if you want to be able to leverage off of the search features of Microsoft Exchange, we can archive over to the user's mailboxes. With the integration of Link with Microsoft Exchange, we have the ability to maintain high-resolution photos over on Microsoft Exchange. With the prior version of Link, your photos were maintained inside of Active Directory, and Active Directory would impose a limit of 48 pixel by 48 pixel. That was the maximum size of your stored photos in AD. By storing photos inside of Microsoft Exchange, that limit's been raised up to 648 by 648. Before you can integrate Microsoft Link and Microsoft Exchange, there are certain prerequisites that have to be met. Before the enterprise voice-enabled users at Carverock Fitness can start to use all these integration features, we have to make sure that we have certain prerequisites that are met. The first integration requirement is that both Microsoft Exchange and Microsoft Link have to be fully installed and up and running. When you set up integration between Microsoft Exchange and Microsoft Link, the two products will communicate with each other securely using mutual TLS. When you first install an Exchange server, the Exchange server will lock down a lot of its directories by using a self-signed certificate. We just have to make sure whatever the certificate is that we're using on the Exchange server side, that it's a trusted certificate over on Microsoft Link. So in a lot of cases, you go out and you get a valid trusted certificate from a provider so that when you go to connect over to the Exchange server from Link, the Link server will see a valid trusted certificate. Now, if we're using internal certificates for the Exchange server, we want to make sure that the authority that has provided that certificate is trusted by Microsoft Link. On the Microsoft Link Server 2013 side, we can use an existing Link Server certificate for our server-to-server -server based authentication, such as our Open Authorization Token Issuer Certificate. We can also use any web server certificate, but we do have some requirements. The length of the certificate has to be at least 2048 bits, the certificate also has to be the same certificate that's configured for the Open Authorization Token Issuer Certificate. The certificate also has to include the name of your SIP domain inside of the subject field. Another prerequisite that we have to look at is the Microsoft Exchange Auto Discover Service. The Auto Discover Service plays a role in configuring user profiles when a user attempts to connect to Exchange for the first time. The user typically provides their email address and their password and the client connects over to the AutoDiscover service, and through an XML exchange, the AutoDiscover service provides information to your client on how to connect into the exchange environment. It provides your clients with information on how to connect over to the client access server, and also how to download content through the web-based services, such as availability information and your address book. The AutoDiscover service has to be configured on Microsoft Exchange before you can integrate Microsoft Link Server 2013 with the product. Once the Auto Discover service is configured on Microsoft Exchange, we then have to configure the Link Server Open Authorization configuration to point over to the Auto Discover service on the Exchange server. When a client powers up and a client performs auto discovery, the client is connecting to an auto discovery directory on the Exchange server and it's exposed through IIS. Inside of the Auto Discover virtual directory is a file called autodiscover.xml. In the same exact directory, there's an autodiscover.svc file. That's our autodiscover service file. So inside of our link server management shell, we would use the set-cs oauth configuration commandlet. You have to define the communication server open authorization configuration and point over to the exchange autodiscover URL, which is the autodiscover.svc file inside of the autodiscover directory. You need to use this commandlet on the link server 
so that your link server knows how to communicate over with the AutoDiscover service on Microsoft Exchange. When you set up the AutoDiscover service with Microsoft Exchange, clients inside of your organization can locate your Microsoft Exchange server and AutoDiscover through a service connection point stored inside of Active Directory. So a client powering up can automatically locate how to connect into the Exchange environment if they can communicate with Active Directory internally. For the Microsoft Link 2013 integration with Exchange, we have to provide an AutoDiscover record inside of DNS. So at carverockfitness.com, we're going to create a record for autodiscover.carverockfitness.com and we'll map that alias down to the FQDN of the Microsoft Exchange server, which in our case is called exchange.carverockfitness.com. Microsoft Link Server 2013 is supported across various Active Directory topologies. At Carve Rock Fitness, we have a very simple design. We have a single forest and a single domain. We designed it this way to try to keep our costs down. With a single forest and a single domain, our user accounts reside in the same domain that the Microsoft Exchange Server and the Microsoft Link Server reside in. We don't have to worry about synchronizing directory objects. We don't have to worry about trust relationships. Everything's in that single domain. If later on we decide to set up another domain within our forest, that's okay also because both Microsoft Exchange and Microsoft Link support multiple domain environments. If you have multiple domains in the same forest, you have to remember that domains will trust all the other domains in the forest and it's bi-directional. They also have a single view of all the objects within the forest because domains in a forest share global catalog servers. It doesn't matter if we set up our domains in a single tree or in multiple trees. For larger enterprises or multiple forest designs, Microsoft Link is supported across forest trust relationships. You just have to make sure that you're synchronizing the proper directory information and that you have your trust set up in the correct direction. The domain or the forest that has the accounts in it would be considered the trusted forest. Before we go through a demonstration, let's take a look at the steps to the deployment process. Before we integrate Link with Microsoft Exchange, we have to have a full Microsoft Exchange deployment, including unified messaging. If your Microsoft Exchange environment is either 2007 or 2010, it requires that you deploy the mailbox, the client access, the hub transport, and the unified messaging server roles. If you have Exchange Server 2013, you only have to deploy the mailbox and the client access roles. The unified messaging is built right in. In our next step, we want to make sure that we have valid certificates on both Microsoft Exchange Server and on Microsoft Link. The certificate used on the Exchange Server has to be trusted by Link, and the certificate on the Link Server has to be trusted by the Exchange Server. Certificates are installed on the Link Server as part of the deployment process using the Deployment Wizard. The next step in the deployment process is to create our Unified Messaging Server dial plans over on the Exchange Servers. We'll see an example of creating a dial plan in just a moment when we go through our demonstration. When you're setting up your dial plan, you'll typically define the security level that you want to use for traffic going between your Microsoft Exchange and your Link Server environment. If you want to secure the traffic between the two products, you would typically use either Secured or SIP Secured. Keep in mind that if you're using Microsoft Link Phone Edition within your environment, the Link Server settings for encryption must align with the Microsoft Exchange Unified Messaging Dial Plan security settings. When we go through the process of setting up the dial plans, you'll see that you can add a server to participate in the dial plan as we walk through the wizard. If you had Microsoft Exchange 2007, you would have to add a server to participate in the dial plan after you created it. When we go to set up the integration between the two products, we're going to find two very useful utilities. The first is called the exchucutil.ps1. It's a PowerShell script that's inside of your scripts directory on your Microsoft Exchange server. This is a script designed to make your life a little bit easier as you're setting up the integration between Link and Exchange. When you run the utility, it has two main functions. The first function is that it is going to create gateway objects for the unified messaging server that identify your Link servers. So your Link servers are going to be identified as gateways to the Microsoft Exchange UM server. The script is also going to modify the permissions on your unified messaging container objects inside of AD. More specifically, your dial plan and your auto attendant containers are going to have the permissions modified so that your Microsoft Link servers will be able to read the information inside of these containers. And it's going to come into play when we're creating contact objects that represent your auto attendant and your subscriber access numbers. 
The second utility that we have is over on the Link server. And the utility is called OCS Office Communication Server UM Unified Messaging Utility. The OCS UM Util is a utility that it's used to create contact objects inside of AD that represent your subscriber access and your auto attendant telephone numbers over on the Exchange Unified Messaging Server side. So when you look at the communication going back and forth between the two products, the Unified Messaging Server identifies link servers as gateways, and the Microsoft Link Server identifies your Exchange Server by contact objects that represent telephone numbers for your subscriber access and your auto attendant numbers. Let's take a look at a demonstration on integrating Microsoft Exchange and Link Server 2013. In this demonstration, we're going to set up the integration between Microsoft Link Server 2013 and Microsoft Exchange. We'll start by opening up our Exchange Management Console, and you'll notice that we connect to the Microsoft Exchange on-premise, and then we'll expand our organizational configuration, and you'll see that I have my role-based administration. I'm looking for the role called Unified Messaging. Over to the right, you'll see that we can configure UM dial plans, IP gateways, mailbox policies, and auto attendance. Let's start off by defining a dial plan. We'll right click and go to New UM Dial Plan, and the name of our dial plan will be Carve Rock Fitness. We're going to be using four digits in our extensions. And when you're setting up the integration with Microsoft Link, the URI type that you will specify will be SIP URI, but you have other choices for integration with other third-party products. With our VoIP security, we're going to set our security for secured, but you can also use SIP secured or non-secured. Our country regional code will be set to 1, and then we'll click on Next. On our next property sheet, we can associate the unified messaging servers with our dial plan. If you have more than one server participating in a dial plan, it provides you some redundancy and higher availability. It also allows for automatic replication of your custom audio prompts through the Microsoft Exchange Replication Service. We'll click on Add, and then add our Microsoft Exchange 2010 server into the dial plan. We'll click on New, and then click on Finish. Once you've created your dial plan, you can go back and look at the properties and you can modify properties for it if it's required. You'll notice down below I can allow users to receive faxes. I can also allow users to configure call answering roles. We can also reconfigure the VoIP security if it's required. On the subscriber access line, we can define the default greeting and the informational announcement provided by subscriber access for the Outlook voice access based users. We can also define telephone numbers to associate for Outlook voice access. So as an example, here I have a number, plus 1-480-227-7000. So this will be my new Outlook Voice Access number. And we'll add it down below. We can also define dial codes for outgoing and incoming configuration. You have setting configurations, including the dial by method, and also the format for the storage of your voicemail. Keep in mind that if you're using a lot of third-party products for active sync, you want to make sure that your devices will support the codec that you're using. So over to the right, I can choose between MP3, GSM, WMA, and G711. We can also define where users can call to if the calls originate from the unified messaging server. Here I'm going to click on OK. You'll also notice that when we create a dial plan, we automatically get a unified messaging mailbox policy created. Inside of here, we can define a lot of the client-side settings. Do we want to allow missed call notifications and message waiting indicators? We can also define the inbound fax server. We can also enable or disable certain features for our clients. On the Message Text tab, we can define the text sent when a UM mailbox is enabled, the text sent when a PIN is reset, or the text included with a voice message or with a fax message. We can also define PIN policies. Minimum pin length and failed logon configuration. We can also restrict where the clients can dial to. And we have the ability to control the integration with protected voicemail, which is the Rights Management Services integration. We'll click on OK. 
At the top of the console, we also have the Unified Messaging Auto Attendance. An auto attendant is a menu-driven system designed to navigate people through our phone system. Let's create a brand new auto attendant and link it with our Exchange environment. Here I'm going to create a new auto attendant. We'll call this Carve Rock Fitness AA for auto attendant. We'll specify the dial plan that the auto attendant is servicing. And then we define the telephone number called the pilot identifier that will be used with this auto attendant. We'll add it down below. And then we can define if we want this to be enabled and if we want it to be speech enabled. We'll click on New. And then click on Finish. If I click on my UMIP gateways, you'll notice that I do not have any IP gateways currently. In order to get my gateways, I can right click and I can create gateways manually. I can also create my gateways by running an automation script. And let's take a look at what this looks like. As you can see, I've opened up the Exchange Management shell, and we're connecting over to exchange2010.carbrockfitness.com. Once inside of the shell, we're going to back up to the root directory, and then navigate to our scripts directory. So we go to Program Files, Microsoft, Exchange Server, V14, Scripts. From within the scripts directory, we'll run the Exchange Unified Communication Integration Script. And it's called exchucutil.ps1. It is the Exchange Unified Communication Utility PowerShell script. When we run the script, it has two main features or functions. Number one, it's going to create gateway objects that are used to represent your Microsoft Link servers. So when the Microsoft Exchange Unified Messaging Server wants to send out notifications to link enabled users, they're going to go out through the unified messaging servers as the gateways. The second feature is this script is going to modify permissions on the unified messaging containers in the configuration partition of Active Directory. And that's going to be necessary because on the Microsoft Link server side, we're going to run an integration utility called OCSUMUtil. And that utility is going to require the ability to read information inside of your dial plan and your auto attendant containers so that it can create contact objects inside of AD to represent those telephone numbers. Well, let's run this utility. You can see that it's contacting a global catalog server. It's defining permissions on my containers in AD, and then it's created a couple of gateway objects. You can see here it's created gateways. And if I scroll up above, you can also see if it's been applying permissions on my containers inside of AD. And everything looks great. Let's close out of there. Now before I go over to the Microsoft Link server side, let's take a look at my server configuration container. When you're setting up the integration between Link and Microsoft Exchange, you may have to install a valid certificate on your Exchange server that's trusted by your clients and also trusted by the Microsoft Link server. In order to administer your certificates coming in from the graphical user interface on Exchange 2010, you can see over to the right that I have my Exchange 2010 server, and I can see my certificates down below. So if you need to create a new certificate request, if you need to import a certificate, or if you want to take a valid certificate and you want to assign services to the certificate, you can do it through a wizard. Now, if you had Exchange Server 2007 service pack, it's a little more difficult because you don't have this graphical user interface. You got to do it coming in through the command line, through the shell. We'll cancel on there. Now that we've run the integration script, let's go back into the unified communication properties and take a look at our dial plan and our gateways. I have a UM dial plan. I've got UMIP gateways. And if I refresh, you can see that I now have multiple gateways showing up. And when I go to the properties for my dial plan, you can now see that it's associated with those gateways. As you can see, the results of running the integration script are apparent in the console. I have my UM mailbox policies and I also have my UM auto attendant configured. Let's close out of the console and switch over to our link server. Okay, we've just switched over to the Microsoft link server and on the link server we want to open up the command prompt so here we're going to open up our command shell, and then navigate up to our root directory, 
we want to navigate over to the OCSUM utility. So here we're going to navigate through our directory. Go to Program Files, Common Files, Microsoft, Support, and we're going to run OCSUM Util. And we have to create the contact objects to represent the subscriber access and the auto attendant numbers. So we'll use the domain switch identifier. And we'll provide our domain, kyvrockfitness.com. So the OCSUM utility is going to connect over to Active Directory. It's going to read the information inside of the unified messaging containers, the dial plan container, and the auto attendant containers. And it will create contact objects to represent any numbers that are not already represented as contact objects. Here you can see the results of running the command. And then if you want to see the results inside of the graphical user interface, we can run OCSUM util without any switches. We'll click on load data. And I should be able to see my auto attendant and subscriber access numbers inside of the graphical user interface. And there you go. And if I look at the properties for these, you can see the configuration. Now, if you need to create a subscriber access or an auto attendant contact from inside of the interface, you can add objects here directly. Let's close out of that console and close out of here. Well, that's the end of the demonstration. And I hope you've enjoyed the video on integration of Microsoft Exchange with Microsoft Link. We'll see you in the next video.